of temperatures or the drastic contrast between highs and lows and temperatures, aka global warming or climate change, um, and how much we impact it just, just by thinking that we're doing well for ourselves, but in reality, we're only adding to the acceleration Just wanted to remind everyone that I don't post a video in the fourth week on the main channel at Holistic Recognition, but I will at times post a personal vlog on my personal channel, Janus's Ong. And so if you want to have an uninterrupted understanding of whatever I'm doing, uh, check out both channels to see if I've updated you know anyone on what's happening in my life in the given month. With that said, I'm going to change gears a bit, uh, even though I could talk about various different, to different topics, um, I would like to have you join me in watching a variety of other content that touch on uh, things where systems thinking is applied. And to begin this next series off uh, of viewing other videos that uh, is out there on the internet, especially YouTube, uh, I'd like for you to join me in reviewing several different videos regarding what is systems thinking. Now to preface this, my understanding of systems thinking comes largely from uh, a, a textbook that went into the history of systems thinking and as it's applied uh, throughout uh, history. But what's more important is how other people understand systems thinking and how it's applied to various different things in life. And so right now we're gonna go into two videos uh, out of the many that are out there right now. And uh, yeah, come and join me and let's uh, find out what systems thinking is for other people. So for this video, uh, this is systems thinking uh, from the perspective of Massachusetts Institute of Technology. For those that don't know, um, even though systems thinking was born abroad in terms of its modern uh, sense, uh, MIT uh, really harnessed it uh, in the 1900s. And so let's see what uh, MIT has with regards to what is systems thinking. Let's do a little myth busting about systems thinking. What systems thinking is not is just about being organized. Can I add A plus B plus C plus D? It's definitely a piece of systems thinking, but it goes much further. Systems thinking is not thinking systematically. Agreed. So if I were to think systematically through 10 different subsystems of a vehicle, and for each of those subsystems, I would ask the question of, what is the noise contribution to the overall vehicle in this subsystem? And then I would sort of add the noise Star. for those different subsystems up. That would certainly be thinking systematically through the vehicle. I'd be going through an enumerated or complete list of all the subsystems. Right. But what's fundamentally missing is I'm not thinking about the vehicle as a system. I'm not right. thinking about it as a whole and having some behavior or properties or functionality that must be treated holistically at the top level rather than at the decomposed level. Let me define a system as a set of pieces that have relationships which performs a function. So I could talk about three bricks sitting on a table. Are these a system? Well, do they have some relationship between them? Not necessarily. I could talk about three subsystems of an aircraft, the wing, the fuselage, and the engines. Do they have some shared function? Yes, flying people from A to B. What I need to add to my definition of systems is that the pieces and their relationships work to produce some functionality or performance that is greater than the parts individually. And I'm going to call that emergence. What does this mean in terms of systems thinking? It means that I'm going to take a series of blocks and I'm going to analyze, well, what are all the blocks that are in the system? What are all their relationships? And how do we use the knowledge of the blocks and their relationships in order to um, understand what kind of emergence I'm likely to see out of? And just to reinforce what he's saying, uh, taking the term emergence aside, it's that for as long as any given uh, piece of uh, block uh, has a relationship to each other, uh, that's what makes it a system. 
uh, when it comes to that relationship, it could be uh, in terms of um, how something will impact it, uh, in terms of flow. Uh, it, there is some sort of contribution uh, of some sort between one thing to another. Uh, it doesn't always have to be a visible thing. Um, it doesn't always have to be some sort of thing according to physics. It just needs to be uh, uh, related to each other in a system. Um, well, ultimately, it just really means relationships. If there's a relationship between the things, it, that's... Uh, well, I, I have to clarify. Even if there's a relationship of category, that's not enough to be uh, what would constitute a system. Um, there has to be... It's not a set. There has to be some sort of um, progressive relationship between each component. Um, I'm probably confusing the hell out of you. Let's just keep going. It's kind of like playing a chess game. You really have to think 10 moves ahead. It starts with what is this invention going to be used for? What's its purpose? And then it moves into how are we going to assemble the pieces and parts to make it work? Uh, that's something I also need to point out with systems, think, uh, systems thinking is that it's not just this art piece that sits isolated in stasis in relationships to itself. Uh, systems thinking, uh, when you're uh, dealing with a system set, you need to have a goal. Uh, that's what helps with analyzing systems. And that's ultimately when you're building a system, uh, what it can produce is what makes it a, a system. It just doesn't sit in isolation. And then eventually, how will we build it? How will we be able to make it work continuously? It's really seeing the whole chessboard. During that creative, inventive process, that's systems thinking. Yeah, well, well there we go. I mean, hopefully I didn't confuse you with all that added um, material, but uh, let's keep going. So that's from MIT. Uh, this one is from Sustainability Illustrated. Um, I believe this is a example or case study in order to explain it. This is new to me. I've never seen this. Really curious. I love animated uh, diagram stuff. In the 1950s, the Dayak people of Borneo, an island in Southeast Asia, were suffering from an outbreak of malaria. So they called the World Health Organization for help. The World Health Organization had a ready-made solution, which was to spray copious amounts of DDT around the island. With the application of DDT, the mosquitoes that carried the malaria were knocked down, and so was the malaria. There were some interesting side effects, though. The first was that the roofs of people's houses began to collapse on their heads. Oh, wow. Turns out the DDT not only killed off the malaria-carrying mosquitoes, but it also killed a species of parasitic wasp that had controlled a population of thatch-eating caterpillars. Thatch being what the roofs of the Dayak people's homes were made from. Without See, and that's one of the biggest uh, problems when a lot of companies, people, societies try to create a solution, they don't think of the systemic impact that would occur uh, when you interfere with a given system. It's very easy for anyone to just buy a solution or make up a solution, apply it, and see immediate success. But the consequences are vast, are systemic. They impact so many different things that people don't realize, which is why I'm personally very critical of what people do on a daily basis within their own lives without realizing the consequences thereof. There's a level of almost psychopathic disregard that happens on a daily basis by so many people, many good-natured, many you know ethically inclined individuals that don't realize that any given act that they do, uh, whether they're conscious or not of participating in in solutions or situations that only contribute to a larger issue they don't of, often recognize that or they don't want to um so not to be a doomsayer but a lot of these choices will amount will pile up to a catastrophic failure 
um, in various different things than we may be seeing now. For instance, um, the heightened sense of of temperatures or the drastic contrast between highs and lows in temperatures, aka global warming or climate change, um, and how much we impact it just just by thinking that we're doing well for ourselves, but in reality, we're only adding to the acceleration of of drastic changes in the world. Now let's continue. The wasps, the caterpillars multiplied and flourished and began munching their way through the villagers' roofs. That was just the beginning. The DDT affected a lot of the island's other insects, which were eaten by the resident population of small lizards called geckos. The biological half-life of DDT is around eight years, so animals like geckos do not metabolize it very fast. It stays in their system for a long time. Over time, the geckos began to accumulate pretty high levels of DDT, Oof. and while That's they rough. tolerated the DDT fairly well, the island's resident cats, which dined on the geckos, did not. The cats ate the geckos, and the DDT contained in the geckos killed the cats. With the cats gone, the island's population of rats came out to play. We all know what happens when rats multiply and flourish. Pretty soon, the Dayak people were back on the phone to the World Health Organization, only this time it wasn't malaria that was the problem. It was the plague and the destruction of their grain stores, both of which were caused by the overpopulation of rats. And I want to add to this issue because this, this is something that we see when, let's say for instance, let's look at global politics. When any given military force comes, let's say for instance the United States, comes into a country and tries to become the savior. There are circumstances where by invading the system of another country, you end up having to replace it with something, whether a new government system, a new personnel, whichever. And if anyone is a big fan of history, you'll know that anytime any nation invades another and tries to become the solution, you have to have a long-term investment in constantly becoming that solution until which you are able to just let it go and let it try to govern itself and solve its own issues. But there's going to be a time frame where there is a reliance on the solution maker because they are the ones that try to invade uh, the particular system. So accountability should be really acknowledged when you're trying to disrupt a system. Uh, unfortunately, there are times, maybe many times, when no one really takes accountability for the system solution that they've created. So this is what we're seeing with the overpopulation of rats. This time, though, the World Health Organization didn't have a ready-made solution and had to invent one. What did they do? They decided to parachute live cats into Borneo. Operation Cat Drop occurred That's to funny. the Royal Air Force and eventually stabilized the situation. And, and that makes sense because the new cats that were brought in uh, we're not eating um, the infected geckos. At this point, uh, these cats were designed to just eat the rats. Um, it's, it's like a counter-systemic solution where one system is already tainted, so you have to create um, a similar but effective uh, method. Uh, to try to restore an ecological balance. Uh, another example that I like to talk to people about with regards to uh, the impact of system uh, systems thinking and a trophic cascade was the entire, I believe it was Yosemite or Yellowstone wolves. Um, we, we can get to that another time. If you don't understand the interrelatedness of things, solutions, often cause more problems. Simple questions often require complex and reflective thinking if good solutions are to be found. 
It is always better to manage by design than by default. That's great. It's it's promoting design. Uh, you know, it's it's funny with regards to thinking of things from a user experience standpoint. Uh, you may have heard me preach this before, but user experience designs foundations uh, harken back to systems thinking. Uh, our design process, our design thinking stems from systems thinking itself. And so, you know, it's very easy for me to practice this, this on a daily basis, whether I'm thinking about the business, I'm thinking about the user interactivity, thinking about impact and how all, their, all those things are related to each other. Uh, so fantastic animation. It really tried to showcase and teach systems thinking by through example, not so much explain it from a meta angle. And I really appreciate that because we need more of those things. We need more people teaching things by example rather than those of like myself just teaching by concepts alone. Um, because that way we'll let people take ownership over triangulating how this all works out. So thank you for watching with me. Uh, let me know your thoughts on these two videos. And uh, I'll catch you guys next time.